or so months after my release from prison. I woke myself up screaming and realized I was damp. In my sleep, I'd somehow managed to lose control of my bowels and my bladder. I was a stinking, reeking mess, just from the sheer fear the nightmare was causing me. among three Westerners in deep trouble in Saudi Arabia tonight. One by one, the three appeared on Saudi television confessing to a pair of car bombings that killed one man and injured five others. I admit and acknowledge that I participated with Mr. Alexander Mitchell in setting off an explosive device on the vehicle. Now that it's clear that he was likely tortured by the Saudis... No, it's do not we, clear. And I've been blindfolded and shackled, hands behind my back, and driven off to what I thought was going to be my execution, to my demise. In my opinion, you are a soldier survivor for the rest of your life. Maybe you can learn to live with it and cope with it, but there will be bruises on the soul that can never be healed. William Sampson remains a damaged man to this day. Free now after almost a thousand days in a Saudi Arabian prison where he was tortured and then sentenced to death. Free to roam the English countryside, but forever trapped by memories of his descent into a living nightmare. The only child of a British father and a Canadian mother, a citizen of both countries, who says that when he faced execution in a foreign land, the British and Canadian governments left him for dead. Bill Sampson descended on Saudi Arabia for the same reason millions of expatriates head abroad. In the desert kingdom, he saw a chance to make good money. Sampson had a PhD in biochemistry and an MBA. But on the heels of a business venture that had failed, he needed a quick way to jumpstart his career. Technically, I was unemployed at the time, in 1998, and I was looking around for work. And I saw a job offered by uh, the Saudi Arabian government for the Saudi Industrial Development Fund as a marketing consultant, and I applied. I needed the work. It was that, it was that simple. He was going, and that was it. I, uh, I wouldn't try to interfere. I never had as when he was a teenager and d trying to decide what he wanted to do with his life. I never tried to influence him. So for my father, my going out to Saudi Arabia, so I was, go I was just going off to another difficult country, you know, keep my head down and uh, watch my back. And did you keep your head down and watch your back? No. <laughs> <laughs> What Samson calls a difficult country is a kingdom steeped in ancient traditions, jolted into rapid Western-style development, fueled by oil. Oil money feeds the coffers of Saudi Arabia's ruling royal family. Saudi Arabia is the birthplace of Islam. The holy city of Mecca attracts millions of Muslim pilgrims every year from around the world. But by Western standards, Saudi Arabia is an insular, repressive place. Here, the markets don't rule. Muslim clerics do. Their call to prayer five times a day is expected to be obeyed. Outside the home, women must cover up. Women can't drive. Liquor is off limits to everyone. Off limits to Saudis, who are severely punished if caught drinking. Off limits to Westerners, too. But not all Westerners take the law seriously. I hadn't been in Saudi Arabia more than 48 hours, I think it would have been, before I was having my first beer. OK, it was home-brewed beer, and the guy who brewed it had done a nice job, and so it was quite palatable, but it was still illegal. And I found it quite funny that I had arrived in what is effectively a dry country, dry as an alcohol, supposedly alcohol-free country, to be finding myself uh, on a weekend, at the beginning of the weekend, having, a, having beer and pizza. Bill Sampson fell in with a group of expats who liked the easy money, but weren't keen to give up their Western ways. 
especially after hours. There were illegal bars everywhere, a sprawling underground social scene where unlikely friendships were forged. There was Raph Skibbins, who worked as a trauma nurse. I had an absolutely fabulous job, and if this, uh, this would not have happened, I still would have been there in my job, and I would have loved it. I loved my job. But it was the job Raph did on the side that would eventually lead to trouble. He would also occasionally work behind the bar at the Celtic Corner. You know, not being paid or anything else like that, he just used to do it because he enjoyed it. Even to his friends, Samson was a prickly character, proud, arrogant, argumentative, ex-military. Both Bill and I are ex-territorial soldiers, and we were invited down to the embassy for the Remembrance Day service. I met up with Bill, and we became pals. Sandy Mitchell was a hospital technician with a young family. For a time, he was also running an illegal bar in Riyadh. So we're never involved in smuggling of alcohol. The alcohol in Saudi Arabia was either made in Saudi Arabia or else it was brought in. Some bar needed beer and the other bar was out of beer. We could call each other and say, OK, I, give you, I, I, I sell you a barrel or two, three, four. No matter. Bill would even uh, do the driving. He, he, he was always aware of the risks we were taking. Samson played a risky game. What he didn't know was that the rules of the game were changing. Outside the kingdom, intolerance was reaching a fever pitch. East against West, Arabs against Jews. Fighting between Palestinians and Israelis was escalating again, and disdain for the West began to spread throughout the Middle East. <laughs> One day, terror struck inside the kingdom, struck very close to home for Bill Sampson. British hospital worker Christopher Rodway was killed after an explosion in his car. His wife was injured. Immediately within the Western expatriate community, everybody began to get nervous. The majority of people's assumptions were that it was a terrorist attack, an anti-Western terrorist attack. Five nights later in Riyadh, another strike against another Westerner. Some expats, including Raf Skivens, were headed to a party in a couple of cars. The car in front of Raf suddenly blew up. The car explosion injured the three as yet unnamed Britons, two men and one woman, while they were driving through central Riyadh early today. Raf in... obviously pulled over and provided emergency first aid. Raf's background is as a trauma nurse. Raf says his involvement was pure coincidence but the Saudis decided to pin the bombing on an outsider. So they arrested Raf and accused him of being the bomber and one who didn't work alone. They say from in the beginning, tell us all about it. About what? All about it. What do you want me to tell you? Everything you know. About what? About the explosion. I don't know anything about the explosion. And then they say, who are your friends with military background? Oh, Bill and Sammy. OK, they pick up the telephone, arrest them. You say everything to save your own skin. I did it, and I put two people on death row. It was, it was as usual. I mean, I, work, I tend to have three alarm clocks. <laughs> I need three alarm clocks most of the time to get me out of my pit in the mornings, make myself my usual sort of uh, extremely strong espresso, my rocket fuel to get the morning started. And my mood <laughs> descended to, to foul in an instant. Because I looked down and the um, right rear tire of my uh, Nissan Patrol was flat. So I turned to my left to walk out to one of the main streets to hail a taxi. It was December 17th, 2000. But Bill Sampson was going nowhere. In fact, he never made it out of his front lane. And as I turned, something moved in the corner of my eye. I realized at that moment, this is it. I'm being arrested. Sampson was taken immediately to the interrogation center. 
of the Saudi intelligence service, the Mabahef. Samson was delivered into the clutches of three torturers. Ibrahim al-Dali, Khalid el Sali, and a third whose name he never learned. And I'd been subjected to whole loads of crazy accusations. That I was a bomber, that was the first crazy one. That I was a drug smuggler, that I was an alcohol smuggler, that I was a homosexual. And each one of the accusations they were leveling at me was carried with it potentially under their law, the death penalty. When I didn't hear from him, I thought he was in Thailand. And it wasn't until after the new year I tried to phone him. And his phone would ring. I would get a dialing tone. But um, I didn't get through. Jim Sampson's first instinct was to call Ottawa. Ottawa fields queries from 50,000 citizens every year who somehow get in serious trouble abroad. That's 1,000 cases a week. I was on the phone, I think, to Mel McDonald, our ambassador there, and then you mean talking to him, getting his take on all of this as well, because he was certainly in the loop in terms of, because he was out there trying to find Bill, his people were involved in all of this. Then you talk to uh, uh, the minister and his people and other people in the department, about what's going on here? What do we do here? What's the game plan here? Certainly the Saudis seem to have a game plan to deny the Canadian embassy any access to Samson. In those first weeks, Canadian officials knew very little. They were told Samson had been arrested, but nothing more. I attempted to continue to refuse to confess, refuse to give them what they wanted, and try to endure the pain. In part was the fact that it might well be that they will give up on their accusations. They might decide that they want to fit the crime to somebody else. That possibly an embassy, Canadian or British, might find out where I was or find out where Rap was in the case of the Belgians. And it would bring an end to it. So I knew that for whatever reason, I had to hold on for as long as possible. But his torturers were getting impatient. So they began a procedure called phalanga, beatings on the soles of the feet that don't leave lasting visible marks. And I was made to sit on the floor, draw my knees up to my chest, and put my arms around my knees. When this was done, I was held in place while Khalid inserted a metal bar between the, my forearms and the back of my knees. Blood just thundered through my head, my neck, my ears. It was such force that there was this loud roaring sound in my ears and it felt as if my eardrums would explode. The most horrific thing is waiting for your torturers to come back to you. Because when they weren't torturing me, they were torturing Bill Samson in the room next door. And when they weren't torturing me, I was left to stand in one leg and listen to Bill's screams. And those screams still haunt me. Sally and Ibrahim would come down and say, for God's sake, why doesn't he cooperate with us? Uh, they came to vent their frustration because they couldn't get to Bill. Because I know what a tough bastard he is. 
is a hard nut to crack. After five days of beatings, his torturers still hadn't broken Samson. What his Saudi captors couldn't possibly know is that their prisoner had always been a handful and had never had much love of authority. He had a hard childhood, not uh, economically hard, but emotionally. He didn't grow up in a very healthy environment as far as his mother and I were concerned. There were lots of problems in the home. My parents had a bad marriage, a very, very bad marriage. Quite frankly, if there were two people who should have never been allowed to get married, it was my parents. I'd been, as an adolescent, um, rather difficult is the best way of describing it with uh, certain authorities, uh, certainly at the school that I went to. He had his own ideas. When people disagreed with him, he would put them down. They'd get annoyed, he'd get annoyed, and it would end up uh, in fisticuffs, I suppose. But in the grip of his Saudi captors, Bill Sampson's natural scrappiness only prolonged the inevitable. After a week of constant beatings and sleep deprivation, his torturers finally got the better of him. Eventually, and this would have been in the six and a half or so days into the process, I finally couldn't take any more of this. And I broke my confess to the single bombing. There was nothing more that they could do to me. They'd stripped me of everything. But that there was one place left that I could go to, that at that time they had neither the techniques nor the ability to go there. And that was in the deepest recesses of my own mind. Smells of Edinburgh, the breweries, the, the mist coming in off the sea. And I would try and remember them in such detail that I could almost feel the coldness of a, of a sea heart coming in through the streets of Edinburgh. because those memories were what made me. And those were memories that the only way that they could eradicate them would have been to eradicate me. And that was something I no longer feared. It took the Saudis about a month to extract numerous written confessions from Samson. Satisfied, they then moved him to an American design prison on the outskirts of town. He was placed in a large cell, and the torture stopped for now. spent a little over two years in these ten-man cells. During that entire period of time, I never had another uh, cellmate or anyone else in the cell with me, so I had this entire cavernous cell to myself. Samson clung to the hope that at some point either Canada or Britain would come to his aid. And then, 43 days in, his hopes rose. Samson was told he would get a visit from the Canadian Embassy. However, his torturers set in on the meeting and monitored every word. I was told exactly what I was allowed to say and not allowed to say. Um, and effectively, they didn't have to tell me that I would be 
tortured or abused if I didn't say the right things. And then two members of the Canadian Embassy were then ushered in. The first consul then began to read off a sheet of prepared questions. Have I been well treated? Have I been abused? Have I been tortured? When I was asked those questions, I answered no, I hadn't been tortured, that I hadn't been abused. I made a mistake. I should have stated what had happened to me in prison. I should have made it clear that I'd been tortured and abused, regardless of the consequences. After that first perfunctory embassy visit, Canadian officials were relieved to establish that Samson was alive. For Samson, nothing had changed. He was back in his cell, feeling utterly abandoned, utterly alone. I detonated the explosive device using a remote control switch. Mr. Mitchell and I then headed south towards Al Jazeera. Six weeks after he'd been arrested, hidden from view, tortured, forced to confess, Bill Sampson's story suddenly was everywhere. And I switched on the television, and the only thing I remember from the news was seeing Bill on the screen. Well, it was, even now, I can feel a terrible feeling in my stomach tightening, and I had that for the next two and a half years. I was standing in this newsroom down there by the news desk when, um, on one of the rolling news channels, we saw uh, the confessions. I think it was um, Sandy was the first. I confirm and confess that I was ordered to carry out an explosion. When the confessions, so-called confessions, were aired, it was huge. I mean, it was shocking. We didn't really know anything. No one had heard of Bill Sampson or the other men. No one had even heard of the incidents um, that they were alleged to have been involved in. The million dollar question is why? That's a question I cannot answer. I, I, can, I have no answer for the reason why we were really arrested. I cannot answer why we were really forced to confess to things we haven't done. I cannot answer why we were forced to confess to terrorism. One theory was that religious extremists were behind the bombs a backlash against Western ideas, Western money, Western influence. The royal family didn't want their Western investors scared off by even a hint of domestic dissent. So Saudi Arabia's rulers looked to lay the blame for the bombings someplace else. Another theory was that Westerners were a convenient scapegoat for Interior Minister Prince Nayef, who controlled the security police, the Mabaheth. What is certain is that Sampson is an expatriate, allegedly at the center of two murderous bombings and one mysterious confession, far from home. The British government didn't appear eager to antagonize its Saudi friends. I think the British government should have worked harder to get these men out of jail. You know, Saudi Arabia is a huge customer of British arms. We have major contracts on all sorts of, in all sorts of industries with Saudi Arabia. Were they bootleggers? Were they spies? Were they guilty of anything? No one in the West could answer these questions. The Saudi authorities weren't providing answers, and they weren't providing the detainees with any way to defend themselves. That those people did not have access to lawyers at the beginning. They did not have access to lawyers when they made their confessions. First time they had that access was a few months after the confession, the televised confession. The British government eventually hired Sheikh Salah al hejalan a prominent lawyer well-connected to the Saudi royal family. In fact, Bill Sampson's torture continued even after his broadcast confession. There were more bombings in Riyadh. The Saudis wanted more names of more Westerners. So the Saudis beat Sampson into giving up the name of his friend, Lest Walker who was promptly arrested. But by now, in March of 2001, Samson's body was giving up on him. The pains that I'd been having, which had migrated from the simple plane of my forearm to both the forearm and the back of my arm, the shoulder blade and the front, and now the front of the chest, came back in this all searing primary pain in the front of my chest. And I just collapsed. I just dropped like a rock. I was fighting for breath. And I knew I was having a heart attack. 
uh, I remember very well the level of anxiety on the part of the Saudi government and uh, uh, the various institutions to see that this operation will be successful and he will get the best medical attention, and he did. Certainly my near death did cause them some anxiety. So the very fragility of my own physical body at that time became a weapon. It became a lever. A lever that triggered immediate results. The torture stopped. And for Samson, conditions finally improved. Samson was even allowed a family visitor, his father. Now, I wasn't particularly happy with him coming to Saudi Arabia, particularly not as I'd already seen threats made against him during my interrogations back in March. But Samson also saw his father's visit as an opportunity to pass on a message he hadn't shared with anybody else, that he'd been tortured, he'd been abused. He was pale, his eyes sunken and um, sort of blue, you know, coming blue underneath on the eyelids. He was in a very poor state, physically. We simply shook hands when we met. There's no hugs or kisses or big emotional scenes. Jim Sampson passed on regards from friends in Canada and Scotland. And when I mentioned Edinburgh, he said, oh yes, he said, this is something like Edinburgh. Well, no, it's more like Ross Scythe, um, a British naval base just to the east of Edinburgh. That it's just like being in the Navy. There's no rum, but there's plenty of the other two. Bill hoped Jim would pick up on Winston Churchill's fabled quip to a British admiral. Your traditions, sir, are drink, sodomy, and the lash. Now, Bill had discounted the booze, but in my mind, obviously, I wiped out anything else. I just thought he was saying he was being beaten. I, I, I couldn't accept the other. In their coded exchange, Bill told his dad he had been raped. I was powerless. That isn't, my son was in terrible danger, being badly, terribly ill-treated, and I couldn't help him. After the visit, Jim told Canadian officials what he thought. His son was being tortured. They counseled quiet diplomacy, not to talk to the media, not to upset the apple cart. Jim Sampson was having none of it. Frustrated, he practiced anything but quiet diplomacy. My son throws anything he can get, his hands up at the guards. At the moment, he is resisting the only way he knows how. With Jim Sampson speaking out, there was increasing pressure on the Canadian government to act on the Sampson file. Now that it's clear that he was likely tortured by the Saudis. No, it's do not we, clear. Do we contemplate any clear. sort of action? It's not clear. I don't know if he's innocent or not. <laughs> I still don't know. You know, I mean, Bill, when you look at it, I know that there is nothing that the Saudis could ever tell me that would convince me that Bill was guilty. But in any absolute sense, I don't know if Bill was guilty. Now, I had been looking forward in an odd sort of way for my trial, and I had spent weeks and months formulating exactly what I was going to say and exactly what I was going to do. And now Ibrahim was playing the role of prosecutor in this court. There were no witnesses, there was no forensic evidence. All that were there was a couple of the booklets that I'd signed as my confessions. I was asked if I wanted to make a statement I refuse to acknowledge this court, deriving as it does its legitimacy from the teachings and precepts of a false prophet and a false god, and deriving as it does its authority from a country and culture that is politically corrupt, socially regressive, morally bankrupt, and genetically degenerate. Well, the look on the court translator's face was a complete picture. He didn't know <laughs> what to do, really. Although he did seemingly translate it in full version because the, I did receive some rather angry looks from everyone. Bill Sampson was sentenced to death, told he was to be publicly beheaded. And I'd been blindfolded and shackled, hands behind my back, and driven off. 
to what I thought was going to be my execution. You'd be taken out into the center of the square, made to kneel down, uh, your hands would be tied behind your back, and at a certain point, the executioner would prod you in the back with the sword, forcing you to sit upright, and then in one swift motion, he would slice off your head. And I just kept repeating to myself throughout all, all this that basically I had to show them how to die. I had to give them nothing. But in the end, the Saudis did nothing. Samson was driven around and then dumped back in his cell. A cruel hoax, another trauma, played out far from public view. Then, four days later, on September 11, 2001, Saudi Arabia's very real connection to terrorism was very much on public view. The whole world quickly learned that Saudi Arabia had terrorists at home and abroad. Osama bin Laden, the al-Qaeda mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks, is from a wealthy Saudi family. Most of the hijackers of the planes that hit New York's Twin Towers were from Saudi Arabia. Samson had no idea of events outside his cell, no idea that he was now a player in a much, much bigger drama. The day after 9-11, he had another visit from the Canadian embassy. This time, having just faced death, Samson's resolve had grown. He decided he would finally tell Canadian officials the truth, that he was being tortured. I then mentioned that now that we are about to discuss our case, shouldn't we talk also about the torture? And the response of the First Consul was to tell me that it was to dismiss it and tell me that it was not helpful and irrelevant. But Ottawa was concerned for Samson's safety. They dispatched Foreign Affairs Minister Bill Graham to Saudi Arabia to plead for Samson's life. There, while waiting for an audience with Crown Prince Abdullah, in walked Prince Nayef, head of the Saudi intelligence service. Basically, he told me, as far as they were concerned, uh, Mr. Samson was guilty and I had no business and I better accept the fact that we were in Saudi Arabia and we had to play by Saudi rules and don't try and persuade them to do things differently sort of really warned me off the case, if you like, that I wasn't going to do Samson any good uh, by making my representations. And in fact, I should really go home was sort of his best advice to me. And Graham did what he was told, even though he suspected Samson had been unfairly treated. One thing they would suggest is that I don't answer hypothetical questions from the press, which could be prejudicial to his case. Well, and I think, gentlemen, we should well, all that, respect that. Would... My view, personally, the confession was extracted under torture. Uh, there's no suggestion whatsoever that he's guilty of, of any offense. So why didn't the Canadian government say that publicly? To issue a statement, yes, he's tortured. What do you do in Saudi Arabia? The Saudis didn't stop dealing with you. You still got to deal with that government on the ground if you're going to expect. There's no power on earth that are going, that's going to move the Saudi government. Often one hears, oh, well, Saudi Arabia is different, that things need to be done there quietly, need to be done there with dignity. I don't quarrel with that. That's absolutely fine. But if you've got somebody who basically is about to be put to death, um, at that point, you need something a bit more than just quiet, dignified approach. You need a really clear statement of principle of why this kind of thing is, is not acceptable. We've taken ambassadors out of countries uh, when we've had difficult situations, and it hasn't changed one iota, probably has made it worse. I think it's absolutely fair to say that at a certain point, failure to speak out about human rights abuses in any country is a form of complicity. Marking his book diaries was a subterfuge and a routine, both of which were key to his surviving solitary confinement. And Bill Sampson did two and a half years of solitary confinement.
for me, I prayed a lot. I dreamt about my family, I dreamt about my life and how I could have changed it. And that was my way of getting through uh, what was absolute hell. We made alcohol in prison. Jimmy and I, you get dates, you put them in a plastic bag and put them in the corner and they ferment and you make alcohol. That was our uh, stuck up finger. If I would have been like Bill in solitary for all those years, for two years and eight months, 972 days, if I would have been on my own, I would have come out walking, talking, but ready for the loony bin. In a way, Bill Sampson was already in an asylum, but it was one he became determined to take control of. My prison cell became my space. It wasn't much, it was easily invaded, and I couldn't leave it. But whenever they had to deal with it, they had to deal with me in a manner that I forced upon them. And I began to formulate a plan. I would refuse to cooperate in everything. It didn't matter what it was. I would just not cooperate with them. We were given a two-inch foam mattress uh, and a blanket. Bill didn't have that. Bill was sleeping on the floor. The taking away his mattress was a form of punishment because he wasn't cooperating with the guards. Uh, I believe he had bitten them a couple of times as well. So whether it's a Canadian thing or whether it was just Bill uh, protesting against being a vegetarian. I began parading myself naked in my cell because I knew that the sight of my naked body would also be offensive to them. I washed myself effectively in my own feces, making it even more difficult for them to handle me, and even more disgusting for them to handle me. Uh, it is unique that an educated and intellectual person with PhD uh, degree and uh, with uh, uh, impressive curriculum vita would uh, would resort to this way. Book three in the Samson saga, the start of his third year in solitary confinement. The corners of his book diary mark the days and nights, while in the corners of his mind are snatches of memory, desperate lifelines to the outside world. More than two years after Samson was arrested, a massive bombing in Riyadh. This time, 34 people are killed, Westerners and Saudis alike. The scale of the attack forces the Saudis to finally reveal their own dirty secret, domestic terrorism. But Bill Samson is told nothing about any of this. He hears or sees nothing outside the walls of his cell. And this is the type of view my son has not had in 27 months. Bill's father, Jim, makes his final trip to Saudi Arabia. Authorities move Bill from his cell to a military hospital for the occasion. We went in to see Bill, who was lying in a bed with a blanket covering him. The reason for the blanket was to hide the chains that he was chained to the bed by. I told my father in no uncertain terms to get out. And he remonstrated with me that we should, that we needed to talk, that he wasn't going away. I again bellowed at him to get the fuck out. He didn't want me there. He was afraid, and so was I. I was afraid that any time the Saudis could seize me. 
And although I was shackled to the bed, I was shackled by only one leg. So I was able to hop off the bed, placing my right foot on the floor, my left leg trailing behind me. And I deliberately went and punched my father in the chest on the right hand side. At that point, pandemonium broke out in the room. Within a minute anyway, he had wrecked what furniture there was in the room, including a medicine cabinet. And for somewhere, he had acquired a chromium plated uh, bar. I was left alone to smash the television set, the CCTV camera. I destroyed everything in that room. And to be quite honest with you, it was great fun. But I realized that that, when that happened, he was the same little son of a bitch that he had been when he was two years old. <laughs> you know, the Saudis had had him in their power, but they hadn't broken him. Criticism is coming from around the world. The prisoners are being held in outdoor cages that Amnesty International says are below U.S. standards for ordinary prisoners. Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib. The war on terror expands and the lines get blurred. Not even Western countries abide by international laws. But in a shadowy barter economy where international prisoners are a form of currency, Saudi captives in Guantanamo Bay meant that Western captives in Saudi Arabia, Bill Sampson and his friends, were suddenly more valuable. Well, a deal was cut because the Saudis, even though they knew we were innocent, they still wanted a pound of flesh. And the Saudis wanted five Saudis released from Guantanamo Bay in Cuba in return for us, even though they knew we were innocent. I have personally presented the, the offer from the British government to help releasing some of the Saudis in Guantanamo uh, in lieu of the, the release of the detainees. Maybe Elvis had a role to play in all of this because everybody else has claimed the role in all of this. I mean, the Crown uh, Prince of Wales was involved. I've seen the Pope was involved. I've seen all sorts of attributions out there. But fundamentally, it's the work of the British and the Canadian governments working together that got them out of there. I was lying on the floor, as was, as was usual by that stage, reading a book and beginning to slowly get sleepy, ready to drift off to sleep, when I heard the double click of the door. First thing I noticed was the stench. It just hit me. It was, there was no air conditioning. There was a stench of urine with feces and just filth. He was skin and bone. His body was covered in sores. The walls were covered in shit. The toilets were all blocked. The room was filthy, it was hot. It was like walking into a sauna. When I told him we're going home, he says, fine, I'll go like this. He says, no, I think you're going to have to shower, mate, and get some clothes on. He says, no, they've kept me like this for 32 months. This is how I'm going home. He said, well, it's not going to happen, Bill. You're going to have to get dressed, otherwise they'll leave you here. So I walked over to the other side of the the cell. I asked the guards some, some soap and shampoo, which were then brought into the cell, and I had my first shower in two years. On the flight itself, I gave very little thought to my impending freedom. There was always in the back of my mind this little nagging thought that the plane could land somewhere and I could find myself shipped back to Saudi Arabia. And I remember walking out the top of the steps and standing for a second and I smelt the the jet fuel and the humid air, because London was suffering a horrendous heat wave at that time, and drinking in the sights that I saw before me of Heathrow Airport that I recognized. And it was at that moment. That I thought I'd won. I'd beaten the bastards. 
That's when I knew I was free. I am proud of him, the way he survived. There's very few people have, who could have done. But one thing that I think helped him mentally was he didn't give in to the Saudis at all. He fought them every inch of the way. James always promised me that I would be the first reporter that Bill would call uh, when he was released, and uh, I was. We spent, I think it was seven or eight days, um, working together in a flat in London. It was harrowing. He screamed, he cried. It was a very difficult story for him to tell. He did report to me after that he as we went through the process, he began to sleep better. And by the end of it, he had his first full night's sleep, I think, since he had been arrested in uh, Riyadh. Back home in Brussels, Raf Skivens is like all the former detainees. He's struggling to piece his life back together. When Bill and I spoke to each other, on the, first, the first time on the telephone, we both cried because he felt sorry for me, I felt sorry for him. In a way, Bill Sampson has plenty to be sorry about. He's unemployed. He lives alone in a social housing flat in Northern England. He's in poor health, and he's haunted by a sense of profound injustice. He wanted independent confirmation that his confession was extracted under torture. Samson went to Copenhagen to the Parker Institute, which specializes in identifying torture victims. Doctors there verified that he had indeed endured phalanga, the beatings on the soles of his feet. Now, if we go back to William Samson on the left side, these are the changes that we've only seen in phalanga survivors. He described torture methods I was familiar with, and my findings were also consistent with the methods he, he claimed to or alleged to have been exposed to. So in my opinion, uh, he is a torture victim. William Sampson says he was tortured, his teeth smashed out, sacrificed, he says, by the Canadian government that did nothing to stop it. I was fighting alone in solitary confinement because of the behavior of your officials. And he's once again taking on the Saudis, now trying to put them on trial. I knew that I would have to take on not just the governments of Saudi Arabia, but also the Western governments involved as they attempted to assist their allies in covering up their crimes. The result of what happened in Saudi Arabia is that I have been branded as a murderer and terrorist by the Saudi Arabians, and no government will assist me in clearing my name, even though they have the evidence to do so. time in my prison cell, one of the recurring themes or recurring dreams that I had in my fantasies was a return to Edinburgh, where I would sit on the summit of Arthur's seat in Holyrood Park, slowly sipping a decent single malt whiskey. There are thousands of people out there who have been tortured, who are living as refugees, who have no right of redress. No government is investigating. No government is pursuing those that torture them. So we have to fight to represent ourselves. And if I can contribute to that struggle, 
we're using my case to do so, then I'm going to continue to do it. It does not make me particularly popular with a large segment of the political establishment, I'm quite sure. But I really don't give a damn. That ain't bad. <laughs> 